Welcome back, everyone. If I could ask everyone to take their seats, I hope you've gotten uh, a decent lunch break. And we're going to begin uh, promptly with session three. Before we get into uh, session three's topic, however, um, I'd like to welcome as our next guest speaker, New York City Council Member Eric Botcher. Elected, <laughs> we're gonna give you two rounds of applause. Elected to the City Council in 2021, Councilmember Botcher represents District 3, which happens to be our district here for the Center for Jewish History. Uh, Councilmember Botcher has dedicated his career to helping the most marginalized members of our society, and after the October 7th attacks, he visited Israel to express solidarity with Jews everywhere, both in this district and around the world. Please join me in welcoming Councilmember Eric Botcher. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for having me today. I really want to thank the Center for Jewish History for this invitation to this very special event. Uh, my name is Eric Botcher. I represent the west side of Manhattan in the city council, which includes the Center for Jewish History. And I'm so proud to have this institution in our district and so excited to be able to support it and continue to support it in many different ways. We uh, live in a time that is hard to put into words in, in so many respects. And one of the most unsettling things about this time for me has been that the, the truths that we've always known, the, the, the things that we've never really doubted have been, have been cast into doubt in ways that I never anticipated in my lifetime. I grew up never doubting that we would have the, the peaceful transfer of power during elections from one administration to another. I grew up considering uh, Roe v. Wade to be settled legal precedent with the, with the strength of law and I really never expected that it would be wiped away. I grew up never really doubting that Americans would uh, deny that the Holocaust existed, that it had happened. Yet here we are in a poll last month, one out of five Americans age 18 to 29 think the Holocaust was a hoax. How did we get here? How, how did this happen? There's so many reasons why um, social media, right? Um, but we know what we need to do. We know what we need to do. And among all the things we need to do is, is speak out speak out and not be silent. We've got to pick a side. Now is the time for all people of good conscience to pick a side. And that means, that means allies picking a side and standing up and speaking out. Because hate speech is, um, as they say, it's like, it's like a virus that spreads and it needs to be stamped out. I've, I've experienced it as a, as a member of the LGBTQ community, working with victims of hate crimes in New York City um, and having been victim of hate crimes. You've got to meet a hate crime with overpowering condemnation, swift, public, definitive, and you've got to send a message that it's not okay, that it won't be accepted, 
that we won't stand for it. Because the minute that it happens and it's not met with that kind of condemnation, that's the, that's the permission that people need to keep going and to keep going farther. And quite frankly, that's happened. That's been what's happening. As upsetting as all this is and as seemingly hopeless uh, that it can be, I actually, I am filled with great hope. And I know that we will prevail and that we will triumph over hate and that we will continue to make progress in humanity because that is what we have always done over time. My, my grandmother died uh, a few years ago at the age of 104. And she was born in 1916 uh, in the Bronx. And when, when my grandmother was born, penicillin did not exist, so a cut, a scratch often led to death by infection. Women did not have the right to vote in, in New York State when she was born. Uh, the idea of a, of a, of a African-American president or, or a female vice president or president, it, it was, would have been inconceivable for her generation at that time. The, her generation saw unspeakable horrors and setbacks, um, like the Holocaust, arguably the worst thing to ever happen in the history of humanity. But they, al they also saw incredible progress. We are gonna see that kind of progress in our lifetime. We're gonna see progress that's beyond what we're even envisioning now, that's better than what we're even envisioning. Um, I know we will, because that's what's happened generation over generation, but that kind of progress didn't just happen automatically. It just didn't happen. It happened because people fought for it. They demanded it. They put their bodies on the line. They put their lives on the line. They stood up. And that's what we need to do right now. That's what our generation needs to do. That's what my, my generation needs to do. That's what this upcoming generation needs to do. And that's what we will do. And I want you to know that I'm standing here with you as a, a strong and unwavering ally as we face this terrible hatred. But I know that we can succeed because when we fight, we win. We always win. And that's what we're going to do. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jonathan Brent, the uh, CEO and Executive Director of the Evo Institute, which is one of the partners in the Center for Jewish History. And I'm very grateful for uh, this opportunity uh, to moderate this panel, this very important panel. But before we do, I do want to thank um, uh, our uh, speaker uh, for those uh, very inspiring words of um, hope. Uh, for the future. I think we can all use that. Um, on, our, on our panel today, we have uh, scholars uh, of uh, the history of anti-Semitism in Europe. And uh, before I introduce them, I do want to say a little something about what uh, uh, is, I think, important in, in this discussion, which is these ideas if they begin in Europe, they do not stay in Europe. If they begin in America, they do not stay in America. Uh, that never was the case, and it certainly is not the case now. Uh, social media has made uh, those boundaries trivial at this point. Uh, but there is something important about this exchange of ideas. Uh, it, that occurred in, in the early part of the 20th century 
uh, going into the 1920s and 30s, which is the history of eugenics in the United States. And I just want to say a brief word about this, because the term we all know from, the, from Nazi ideology, Untermensch, was in fact borrowed from an American historian, Lothrop Stoddard, who wrote a book in 1920, and we know this because Alfred Rosenberg footnotes the use of the term in uh, his um, myth of the 20th century. Um, much of Nazi race thinking was the product of American legal system as well as uh, eugenics. And in this same book in which Lothrop Stoddard coined this term, Underman, he also makes the point that uh, it's not enough to say that Jews, uh, many or most, if not all Jews, are Bolsheviks. He takes this uh, another step, and it's worth thinking about as we proceed with this discussion that this Bolshevism in the Jewish community is inherited from one generation to the next. It's not taught, it's inherited. And that's why the Jews are suspect. It's not even racial. It's that this alien ideology is part of their DNA. And so the discussion, I think, of anti-Semitism in Europe and in America uh, can profit perhaps a little bit by not thinking in terms of strict categories, but in terms of the way ideas get transformed into other ideas uh, over time. And one of those uh, important ideas with which we are going to begin our panel has to do with the, pro with the problem of Holocaust inversion. Before we begin with that subject, I do want to introduce our panel. And our first speaker is Wendy Lauer, who is an American historian, widely published author on the Holocaust in World War II. Since 2012, she holds the John K. Roth Chair at Claremont McKenna College in Claremont, California and in 2014 was named director of the McGrublian Center for Human Rights at Claremont. As of 2016, she serves as the interim director of the Jack uh, Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. Lauer's research areas include the history of Germany and Ukraine in World War II, the Holocaust women's history, the history of human rights and comparative genocide studies, her book Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields was translated into 21 languages. It was a finalist for a National Book Award. I really do hope that you all go to the table of publications outside in the Great Hall and look at some of the extraordinary books that you will find there, among which is The Ravine, a family of photograph, a Holocaust massacre revealed, uh, which is Professor Lauer's book published in 2021. It received the National Jewish Book Award. Um, our next uh, panelist is Jan Zbigniew Grabowski, uh, who uh, uh, is a Polish-Canadian professor of history at the University of Ottawa, specializing in Jewish-Polish relations in German-occupied Poland. The most important thing, I think, to say about Professor Grabowski is that he is not just a historian of anti-Semitism in Poland and Holocaust denial. He is actually a combatant in the process itself and has been the subject of, uh, I think, several lawsuits, uh, threatening jail, uh, and uh, much abuse uh, continuously in the Polish media, uh, by the Polish government, and by other so-called Polish scholars on the subject. Um, he is, uh, Professor Grabowski uh, is the co-founder of the, um, uh, uh, the Institute for the Study of the Holocaust in, in Warsaw, 
uh, the Polish Center for Holocaust Research in Warsaw, and is best known for his book, Hunt for the Jews, Betrayal and Murder in German-Occupied Poland, in which he calls attention to the role of uh, so-called bystanders uh, in this process. Uh, uh, there is much more to say, but I will end simply by uh, saying that in May of t this present year, Professor Grobowski uh, was giving a lecture at the German Historical Institute in Warsaw when uh, a far-right politician attacked the stage, smashed the microphone, and uh, put an end to the conference, which gives you some idea of how volatile, how vicious, how uh, uh, hateful so much of this so-called research actually is. Our third speaker is Philip Spencer, who is Emeritus Professor in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Kingston University and Visiting Professor in Politics at Birkbeck University of London. He was the founder and director of the Helen Bamber Center for the Study of Rights, Conflict, and Mass Violence at Kingston University. He is a trustee of the, the Wiener Center uh, Library for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide and a research associate of the Paris Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. He is a member of the European Sociological Association Research Network for the Study of Racism and Antisemitism and a member of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. If these people don't know what's going on in Europe, nobody does. Um, so I'd like to begin uh, our panel today uh, by, say, by, by asking uh, the, the question broadly, uh, how does what you find in Europe, in your spheres of interest in Europe, how does that compare uh, with what uh, appears to be happening in the United States, and in particular with uh, this subject that is, is so infuriating to so many of us, which is the inversion of the accusation of genocide, uh, the, the uh, Jews become Nazis, and are acting as Nazis. The Holocaust uh, was, in fact, perpetrated by Jews, a, an accusation that is often made. Um, and uh, and and how do you how do you see that? We see it here in the United States. And thank please, you. thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for for coming today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm not formally affiliated with the Holocaust Museum any longer. I'm on the academic committee, but so I just wanted to be clear about my remarks today are my own. Um, and I'm going to focus a little bit on, uh, as much as possible, on Ukraine, which is where I've done a lot of my research uh, for my publications, going back to my dissertation. Um, I'm going to talk about Ukraine today, primarily, and the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. And bear in mind that I'm, I am an historian um, of the Second World War, so these Russian uh, anti-Semitism in the form of Holocaust inversion is something that I am clearly uh, sensitive to. And I've, what I've seen is three different variations on this, although there are many, because so much of this is happening in social media and it can just can take on, it's very malleable and can, uh, and memes and, and so forth. Um, and also in official speeches by Putin himself and his version of history and his weaponization of history and by his leadership, Lavrov, for instance, um, in the summer of 2022. So I see three inversions. One is Putin, the genocide heir, who is um, arguing that Ukraine, Ukrainians in the eastern regions, in Donbass, Donetsk, um, that those uh, Russians that are living there are being subjected to genocide, that the Ukrainian government is actually committing genocide, right? So there's a lot of this is just a lot of projection, a lot of mind twisting, and a lot of, um, of as you said, this inversion. So Putin's accusing Ukrainians of committing genocide against Russian, um, ethnic Russians in a part of Ukraine. Um, of course, there are echoes of this in the past. Hitler made this similar argument. Um, in the words of, of kind of rights language of national self-determination, that ethnic Germans in the Sudetenland needed to be protected, and that was his pretext for the start of the Second World War. 
Um, this is also something that is happened in Russian history and as part of, for instance, the Tsar laying claims to Slavs, um, Orthodox Slavs in the Balkans, um, in Serbia, and that was part of that um, uh, justification and call for war in that way. It's an imperial um, strategy. Um, secondly, the weaponization um, and distorting of the Holocaust in calling for, Putin calling for, the denazification of Ukraine. Um, that Ukraine uh, is filled with all Nazis, including the leadership, and they needed to be kind of rooted out. And this is um, his attempt, Putin's attempt to draw on the memory of the Great Patriotic War, which is a huge source of patriotism for ordinary Russians, um, and to kind of foment that, um, uh, uh, mobilize ordinary Russians to this cause um, in that way. He's, he knows exactly the kinds of um, linguistic touchstones that that sets off. Uh, what I find interesting is when he labels Ukrainians as Nazis or Nazi collaborators, um, uh, something that I came to my attention reading Masha Gessen's work, both in The New Yorker, uh, and also her new introduction to the novel Babi Yar, which I all recommend, the new edition of that since the war came out. And that in Soviet historiography, the Great Patriotic War, um, the chronology, the chronological frame of that in all these multiple volumes uh, <laughs> that appear and, and that had to appear in, in ordinary households in the Soviet Union, 1941 to 1945, right? So if we're gonna talk about collaboration and the Second World War, I find it very interesting that Stalin, who signed a pact with Hitler in 1939, which started the Second World War, which resulted in the loss of 27 million Soviet citizens, gets a pass, right? The, the, the way they look at the war is 41 to 45. And of course, for Ukrainians and Poles and um, uh, people in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, that period from 39 to 41 is, is, very, is very critical. The third um, inversion that I've seen is um, accusing Jews as being Nazis. This is Lavrov in 2022. This is an important moment in um, uh, Russian-Israeli um, relations during the war. Um, and even that Hitler was Jewish. Um, you know, and that um, Jews caused the Holocaust. That's, that's the most um, disgusting um, accusation of all. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, uh, before I start, uh, very briefly, I would like to mention that in one of the panels before, um, a statement has been made that our role as academics is to be critical and not activist. And I do, in principle, agree with this statement with uh, slight caveat, however, that sometimes any criticism transforms us into nolens volens, so unwilling activists. And that has been, as you have heard also, my role. Not that I sought this uh, dubious distinction, but simply stating the obvious uh, can get us scholars in a, um, in a mass of very hot uh, water. Now, uh, turning to the inversion, uh, I will be drawing on uh, on a Polish example, admittedly an uh, important one from the point of view of uh, anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, uh, as Poland uh, is uh, the place where these things happened, uh, where five out of six million Jews have been put to death, which gives uh, a certain horrifying panache, if you will, to the relations between uh, Jews and non-Jews in that particular unfortunate uh, area. Now, in terms of Holocaust inversion, there is not much to be said, actually, because Holocaust inversion implies an interest in the Middle East, uh, and there is very little of it, actually, nowadays in Poland. Yes, as Wendy mentioned, I agree with you, there is an element of Jews who uh, were collaborating with the Germans in order to provoke their own demise. This kind of uh, a fantastic statement appears here and there. However, what I would like to bring to the table here, uh, because if we, if we, have we met, had we met before October 7, I would have said that my words or my experience is very important. Nowadays, it takes backseat to our North American experience because things are really navigating very quickly into unknown here. However, it doesn't mean that we can forget that these troubles are inter 
connected. So what you have to, what we have to understand is that during last eight years, I'm still drawing on the Polish example, but let let me remind you that this spills. This is the let's say the largest uh, largest Central European country of the of the European Union, and uh, this uh, it spills out to the two Baltic states, to Romania, uh, to Hungary. Um, I, but I don't want to go too far. And um, we have to remember that over the last eight years, since uh, nationalists in Poland gained power until very recently. They surrendered power not quite grudgingly, withdrawing slowly since December last. Um, so for eight years, markers have been moved far, far to the right. In other words, things which w in back in 2014, 2015 would have been absolutely unimaginable uh, became, became mainstay. Things, I mean, deeply, um, let's say, permitted with anti-Semitism, riding anti-Semitic wave, which should not be uh, misunderstood and cannot be downplayed um, and uh, dismissed because these things translate later on into um, into problems uh, on a global scale. So what you what you see is something called dejudization of the Holocaust, the removal of the Jews from the Holocaust. This has become an official, unstated by official policy of the Polish state with its enormous resources of the, of the last eight years. How it's being done, once again, we don't have the time. I just signal a problem when Auschwitz, in according to 50% of polled Poles today, think that Auschwitz primarily is a place of Polish suffering. When 71% of Poles think that uh, responding to a question, who suffered more during World War I, World War II, uh, sorry, um, uh, the Jewish nation or the Polish nation, the answer is 71%. Poles suffered equally or more than the Jews. Something tremendously important happened and we overslept it. The consequences are really, really uh, dramatic. Then we have Holocaust envy, a problem which existed for years. However, now it acquired enormous significance. So our suffering, non-Jewish suffering, is more important than Jewish suffering. These things fuel uh, anti-Semitism in an unprecedented way. Once again, the states have entered this uh, Holocaust denial, I would call it. It's called distortion, but let's not forget that Holocaust distortion is a form of Holocaust uh, denial. And important, I have many other things to say, but I will reserve them more later on. Last uh, for this particular part is that nowadays, and this is something which concerns equal Lithuania, it concerns Hungary and Poland uh, and other countries of the area, anti-communism trumps anti-Semitism. Anti In other words, if you are, have impeccable anti-communist credentials from the wartime, you can easily be a killer of the Jews and still you are going to be example for the youth as it happened in Poland, it happens in Poland still. So these are just the signs, few signs I wanted here to bring to, to the table. Thank you very much. Um, Philip. Please. Thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come here and speak. Um, I want to say something quite personal to start with, if I can, uh, which is about October the 7th and how I see it as a turning point. I've been active, as well as being an academic, on the left all my life. Um, and I've lived in Britain through three waves of anti-Semitism. The first was in the 1960s when the neo-Nazis in Britain burnt down my local synagogue. The second was in the 1970s when there was a threat from the far right in British politics, the National Front as it was known, and there was a very big mobilization against it by an organization called the Anti-Nazi League in which I was very active. And it was really a movement led by the left in the UK. What we are seeing now in Britain and right across Western Europe is a wave of anti-Semitism which far exceeds both of those two previous experiences, but with one, catas one particularly catastrophic element for me, which is the presence of a significant number of people on the left now in the anti-Semitic movement. I am now witnessing in Britain, and you can see the same phenomenon across the cities of Western Europe, large numbers of people marching through the streets with confidence, 
shouting anti-Semitic slogans with impunity. And this is, to me, is deeply disturbing. Did I expect it, and what is, are the implications of it? I have been watching this and thinking about it and writing about it. And if you need a cure for insomnia, I have written a book about anti-Semitism on the left. <laughs> and try to understand it. And the way I came with my late friend Robert Fine to think about it was that there are two kinds of universalism. One is a universalism which includes Jews, and there is another kind of universalism which excludes Jews and sees Jews as its other. And there is to that section, that universalism of the left, a particular attraction in anti-Semitism which is at least, has at least two component parts. And I think this has major implications for how to think about anti-Semitism in Western Europe today. One is it's an explanation for why things haven't turned out the way we wanted them to. And the other is an instrumentalism, that maybe there is something we can use anti-Semitism for. We can find allies who might be anti-Semitic, but can be drawn to us. Now, a key consequence of this adoption of anti-Semitism by a section of the left, and not by all of it, that was the point of the book, that there are two traditions here. A key consequence of this now is the breaking of a taboo. Anti-Semitism previously was taboo, and now it isn't. And a key element of breaking that taboo is Holocaust inversion. But I would actually go further, and I would say it's not only Holocaust inversion, it's a genocide inversion. Because we owe the concept of genocide to a Jew, to Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jew who lost 49 members of his own family to the Nazis. And because of Lemkin's hero heroic work, he got the United Nations in 1948 to adopt the concept of genocide and to pass the Genocide Convention. And when you waive the charge of genocide against Jews, you turn the concept on its head. There is a profound inversion, not only of meaning, but of values. And this has major implications both for Jews and for the real victims of real actual genocide, which in recent years have included, after all, large numbers of Muslims, the Yazidis, the Rohingya, and the Uyghurs. So it is at the same time a double wound, a double insult. It is, as Jan has mentioned, a form of denial it says that you are not the actual victims of genocide. Others are, and you are the perpetrators. It turns victims into perpetrators. But it is also a profound insult to all the victims of real and actual genocide. A great Jewish social theorist, a man called Max Horkheimer, a man of the left, who confronted the Holocaust, had to rethink what he understood by anti-Semitism in the middle of the Holocaust. Put it very clearly, he said, whoever aims at the Jews, aims at humanity. Th thank you very, very much for those, for those words, Philip. And I would like to uh, take uh, the second uh, round of, of questions in the direction that you've uh, outlined, which is the political dimensions of anti-Semitism today. Uh, a lot has been said about the social dimensions of anti-Semitism, the way it spreads in college campuses and around, um, and around uh, societies, etc. But it's the political dimension of it, it seems to me, that could be the most worrisome. And I wonder if you could expound a little bit on what those might be in England, and uh, also on this idea that uh, perhaps 
Uh, another element of this unprecedented time is that on the subject of anti-Semitism, left and right seem to meet. The divisions seem to be breaking down. Um, so, please. Do you want me to start? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. Um, I don't want to hog the microphone, for God's sake. Um, this is a very difficult question, and I've been giving it quite a lot of thought for a long time. Um, I will say something about Britain. I might, if I have a little bit of time, to talk a little bit about France and Germany, because I want to talk about Western Europe, because it's not confined to Britain. And just to go back to your first question, which is the difference or similarity between America and Western Europe. Um, I think the point you made at the beginning, which is, or somebody made, which is that it's a global, things move around, that's absolutely right. There are influences from the United States in Western Europe, and they work backwards as well. But there are different, also, national contexts, especially important for Jews. To be a Jew facing anti-Semitism in Germany now has to be understood in the context of the Nazi legacy. To be a Jew facing anti-Semitism in France has to be understood against the context of the betrayal by the Republic under Vichy of French republicanism. And Britain is different, and there is an important difference for British Jews, because the culture in Britain is a culture, is a liberal democratic society, and Jews were tolerated in Britain. And that's different to coming to the United States, because the condition of toleration is, and this is how I was brought up, keep quiet and everything will be okay. But it's not okay. So if I want to talk about Britain and British politics, I'm afraid I do have to talk a little bit about the experience of the Labour Party and of, of the leadership of the Labour Party passing into the hands in 2015-16, into the hands of an anti-Semite, which was an unprecedented phenomenon. How did this happen and what did it mean? It happened for reasons that bear very much on what I said earlier on about disappointment, about the politics of disappointment. The man who became leader of the Labour Party articulated a disappointment that many people had on the left after years of conservative government and of the impotence, the apparent impotence of the Labour Party. So they turned to a man who had never been anywhere near power, precisely because he'd never been anywhere near power. And he appeared to be a highly principled, almost saintly figure, unsullied by compromise. So there was an understandable move to wanting somebody who would break with the past compromises and offer new hope. But the problem was that this man was an anti-Semite. And it wasn't incidental. Jews knew this about him. They knew that he'd associated with anti-Semites under the guise of anti-Zionism. He had personal connections, and he had expressions of anti-Semitism that were not difficult to find, including endorsing a mural, and this goes to your point about right and left, which could have been painted by a Nazi with stereotypes of Jews straight out of Der Sturm. But we, can't, we shouldn't personalize this, because it's not an accident that this man became leader of the Labour Party. He was able to articulate and draw on a tradition on a part of the left that presented itself as radical, believed itself to be radical, believed itself especially to be anti-racist. Right? And it was anti-racist because it was critical of British imperialism, and of the legacy of British imperialism, which was continuing racism in Britain, which personally I have been active in fighting all my life. But it blended that with an anti-Zionism in which Britain was seen, astonishingly to anybody who knows this history, as the creator of the state of Israel. <laughs> I could tell you some amusing anecdotes about this, but I, I won't waste your time here. <laughs> but also an anti-Americanism that grew apace after 9-11 and after the Iraq War. So that what you got here was, and if we go back to the 19th century, where the instrumental idea that anti-Semitism could be an advantage 
If people hated Jewish capitalists, maybe they could be brought to hate all capitalists. What was called, not very helpfully in my view, the socialism of fools, because it had nothing to do with socialism, now became replaced by what has been called rightly the anti-imperialism of idiots. <laughs> but here there was a fatal move because that section of the left found an ally in British society of radical Islamists who were also anti-American, also anti-Zionist, and also anti-Semitic. But let's be clear, I'm talking about radical Islamists here, by no means all Muslims, right? But it had a resonance. So an alliance got formed, and this was a fatal development. Thankfully, so I want to end on a good note, this bit, that is no longer true. And it touches on something we will be talking about in a minute, which is that the Labour Party under this leader suffered its most humiliating defeat ever in 2019. And he is no longer leader of the Labour Party, and anti-Zionists and anti-Semites are no longer in control of the Labour Party. That's the good news. Thank you. I, I, th I think nowhere has the penetration of anti-Semitism into political power been as evident in Europe and in the United States, with the exception of Hungary, perhaps, uh, as in Poland. So, yeah. Okay, just to share briefly, uh, <clears throat> I'm starting usually without optimism, but I will try to steer towards it before the end. So uh, sharing a bit of private uh, recollection, uh, it's uh, 19... 79, uh, I mean a high school equivalent, Polish equivalent of grade 11, and our history teacher declares, uh, dear lads, Hitler did many bad things in Poland, and you understand the rest of the, but uh, the rest of the phrase probably I don't have to pronounce. Um, and I sat there, I remember, red in the face, uh, and in disbelief how a teacher can say a thing like the thing like this and I said someone certainly have, will raise their hand and protest right um, no one did and I said I can't do it you know being Jewish perhaps ever everyone will say Grabowski is a Jew um, so I sat it out and that was the last time I allowed a thing like this to to fly by me without my reaction um, but the thing is it demonstrates that back even then in 1979 it was possible to say that it was a good thing that Hitler murdered the Jews and it came across as a no normal regular statement. Well, 1979 was a long time ago, but fast forward to, uh, to 2015. Um, about anti-Semitism being at the, base, uh, at the base, a foundation of political possibility, of political project, there is, um, there is a presidential election of 2015, fundamentally important, one which decided about the da downfall of Polish democracy, in which the televised debate, in which the um, challenger to the to the president in office, addressed his first question regarded a Holocaust denial. Basically, he denied a part of the Holocaust. Um, and uh, this, this had probably some kind of an influence on elections which he had won. Uh, it was, for me, extraordinary that in order to look for the votes of anti-Semites in 2015, a Polish politician vying for the highest office would, as a first question, uh, request apologies from the president in office for having apologized for the crime of Hidwabne, a place where Poles murdered their Jewish neighbors, as it being untrue and false. And, and then what you have is that uh, in the politics in Eastern Europe, at least in Poland, the, the anti-Semitic, um, let's say, how to call it, uh, um, imaginary world of uh, mental iconography of anti-Semitism is all present. Um, imagine now the, all the 
uh, tropes, uh, canards of anti-Semitic uh, statements are now being used against uh, sexual minorities, against uh, refugees from the South. Uh, it's actually painful when, uh, as a Holocaust scholar, I listen and watch um, uh, the um, politicians repeating um, the most horrifying statements from the 1930s and 1940s. Does it mean that there is a political, uh, let's say, project based on anti-Semitism? No. But is there a project which is supported by anti-Semitism? Yes, most definitely. It doesn't mean that you can win elections basing your, um, your message entirely on anti-Semitic um, tropes and ideas. But unfortunately, in some cases, it uh, will, it can, uh, can uh, help. In, in keeping with this, uh approach, I'm going to say a little bit too about my, my background and why I came to Ukraine and why I'm actually sitting here. And the fact is that, um, and there's hope in this too, that things have changed in Ukraine and Ukraine has evolved. And what we're seeing now is a country at war, under siege, unifying behind that just to survive. And understanding that anti-Semitism is a source of division and to resist that. Um, let me back up just a minute though because it obviously wasn't always the case. And this entire war, this, the theme of anti-Semitism has been um, interwoven into it in a way as part of the struggle. When I first went to Ukraine in the summer of 1992 and then thereafter um, on several occasions, often funded by um, including the Soros Foundation doing a lot of kind of educational work, um, taking on doctoral students on, on the history of the Holocaust, history of totalitarianism, the Holodomor, and so forth. And in my first visits, um, as Ukraine was trying to become a nation, an independent nation, and, um, they declared their independence in August 1991, um, trying to find their way out of this history and the weight of the history of Ukrainian collaboration in the Holocaust, and Ukraine being um, as far as victims, one out of four victims of the Holocaust resided in what were the borders of Ukraine in 1991. So this was a country that had been overlooked as far as the history of the Holocaust. Most of the victims died on that terrain, were not, very few of them were documented, um, and that's been kind of the driver of, of a lot of my research. Um, but what happens is when Ukraine is trying to become a nation, not only Ukrainian legal specialists coming to the Library of Congress where I was working, studying constitutions, writing their constitution kind of from scratch or from other models. So just think about like the creation of the nation and what that entails. Um, but in its past started to draw from their so-called national heroes. Who are those heroes, right? And they started to draw from um, people like Stepan, Stepan Bandera, right? Um, Melnik, the heads of these radical um, kind of Ukrainian nationalist organizations um, in the era of fascism in the interwar period, uh, who were um, both trying to um, fend off more Russian uh, influence and also conflated um, Russians with Jews and, and Bolsheviks with Jews, and so you have that that famous um, conflation. That now is starting to um, come apart, that conflation. And now we're starting to look at the growth of anti-Semitism in Russia, where there have been riots in the North Caucasus since the war broke out, um, where we do have um, uh, you know, a large Muslim population when you look at the Russian Empire and across Eurasia, um, and also within Ukraine and Crimea. Um, and also the incidents of um, anti-Semitic vandalism that have taken place, mostly in the regions that have been occupied by the Russians, and the use of anti-Semitism, the instrumentalization and weaponization of anti-Semitism by the Kremlin, um, the vilification of Ukraine as a, as, a, as a strategy. And this has a deep history, too. It get, got me thinking about the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a complete Russian fabrication at the late 19th century, again, meant to um, so more discord uh, abroad within the Western countries. Um, it's part of an anti-Western kind of campaign, and now Putin is kind of mobilizing the global south as well, and just trying to pull on every lever he can to weaken uh, Ukraine and, and alienate it um, in the eyes of, of Europeans and, and the West, as it were. Um, but will this be forever? Will Ukrainians 
the level of anti-Semitism at an all-time low, according to a Freedom House survey. Um, last year, there were zero physical assaults on, on Jews. There were five cases of vandalism. And in fact, there are more attacks against, um, there's more homophobia, more attacks against the LGBTQ community and against the Roma um, uh, than there are Jews. And part of this also has to do with we have a Jewish president, Zelensky, of course, who himself lost family members in the Holocaust, who upon his um, beginning of his presidency, which started in 2019, made a trip thereafter, shortly thereafter to Israel, um, to Jerusalem, um, and has developed stronger ties with Israel, which is also something Putin is trying to drive a wedge between Ukraine um, and Israel. I started to think about to what extent this is going to hold, this, this ability of Ukrainians to be unified and to not tend to resort to what we see historically happening in times of crisis and times of war, and that is an upsurge in anti-Semitism. And so for the last month or so, um, I've been working with um, my colleagues on the ground um, who have been surveying uh, Ukrainians, ordinary Ukrainians, Ukrainian youth um, across the country, east and west, about morale. Um, is, the, is the decreasing morale, um, given the lack of weapons going to Ukraine now, and that Putin resumes the bombardment you know, right in December, while we all had our eyes on Israel, um, uh, Putin resumed the bombardment in December, is this lowering morale going to potentially jeopardize um, Zelensky's leadership, and will there be more attacks, you know, anti-Semitic kinds of um, uh, images of Zelensky and so forth? And I just kind of got the results back, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Actually, um, what they found is there's very few overt um, acts of anti-Semitism, as I mentioned, which Freedom House already determined. Um, part of that is because Zelensky passed a law in 2021 that um, uh, one could be um, punished monetarily for committing acts of anti-Semitism. Called, they called it hooliganism. Uh, and then in 2022, acts of anti-Semitism, manifestations of anti-Semitism in Ukraine were criminalized. Um, you could get up to five years in life, depending on the, the, the severity of the, uh, of the attack. You could be barred from holding public office and other offices for up to three years. And also there are other you know, monetary fines, right? So there is, and in, in to the point of the earlier session and European um, uh, patterns of the use of law, um, not only um, to persecute, but to also try to control and to try to suppress um, anti-Semitism. So the set, basically the climate now, um, again, it could change, is that it's at a t toned down level, mostly people overhearing things like um, anti-Semitic jokes. Um, sometimes it's kind of wrapped up in the fact that Zelensky's a, a comedian. Um, the leaders are very quick to shut anti-Semitism down publicly, which has been very, I think, very constructive. Uh, but there haven't been um, a lot of anti-Semitic projections of Zelensky himself as a leader. There's a, uh, they're, still, they're still standing very loyal to him and very proud that he stayed. They often talk about the fact that he stayed, he didn't leave. Um, uh, probably the one criticism that came up about Zelensky is that he, his English isn't very good, and they don't think he's representing the country kind of on the world stage, and, and, and he could be a better diplomat in that regard. So there's just some of my observations. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, we are now uh, in, the, in the third part of our panel, and uh, I think, uh, at least to me, the most important question in all of this is, what is the cash value? What do you think it is, the cash value? What, what is this going to lead to legally? Do you think in Poland there will be laws passed against Jews? In, in England, in, in, uh, in Russia, for instance, uh, are there going to be uh, social corridors drawn of exclusion? Um, what do you think? Uh, you know, tangibly, Jan, I'd like to begin with you in this, uh, is going to happen in Poland as right. a consequence of all this. Uh, you know, it's a very comforting thing for a historian to tell you that I'm not, that I'm not looking into the future. I'm looking into the past, but of course, uh, I can make an effort here. And, you know, back in 20, um, as you know, uh, I am coming often on the pessimistic side, but this is my experience uh, talking. And uh, the thing is that uh, in January of 2018, so six years ago, uh, Poland has voted itself a so-called Holo Polish Holocaust law, um, uh, which was one of the more, scan more scandalous pieces of legislation 
legislation passed by the Polish Parliament stipulating uh, prison terms uh, up to three years for people who uh, dare to say that uh, a Polish nation was in any way, shape or form complicit in the Holocaust. Uh, now, um, at the, day, the day that the vote has been taken, there were 409 members of par Polish parliament present in the area, and uh, guess how many voted against that law? Four. Um, which gives you an idea that on this particular issue, there is this uh, dramatic, uh, we can say, uh, national unity, issue being the so-called defense of the good name of the nation, um, pride of the nation. Um, so as you know, um, in October, a very uh, fragile coalition won elections after eight years of, uh, I'm not uh, hesitate, hesitant to say it, fascist policies of the Polish state. And I must tell you that in this meeting, uh, in meetings here, since morning, I was speaking to many of my American colleagues and they said, look, in the present climate, we have to weigh each and every word we say in public. And I said to them, welcome to the club. <laughs> and I have been doing this for the last eight years and it's actually very good for your discipline. So when I say fascist, <laughs> fascist policies, I am ready to respond in court to, to a possible next lawsuit. And so the thing is that on this particular unfortunate ground, there is a, a measure of national, unfortunate, a measure of national unity <clears throat> and democratic parties winning the vote, uh, uh, they promised deep changes, deep changes trying to restore democracy. Now there are two institutions, uh, many more, but two outstanding institutions of memory control, of uh, falsification of history of the Holocaust, among others. One is called the Institute of National Remembrance, uh, which is uh, an unprecedented institution. It has, doesn't have an equivalent in wor on the world scene regarding its size, uh, with a budget of hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Um, so this institution's budget for the current year yesterday has been uh, brought up by additional uh, 10 or 15 million dollars, uh, not that the institution was abolished, quite to the contrary. Uh, another Pilecki Institute, equally deeply involved in Holocaust negationism, has opened its new office in New York City uh, just um, two months ago. Uh, so uh, I would like to believe, and I know that there are true Democrats now at the helm, uh, but unfortunately their priorities are elsewhere, not in this particular uh, area, and uh, unfortunately anti-Semitism thrives on appeasement to, um, to uh, repeat after Margaret Thatcher. Um, so um, so anti-Semitism thrives on appeasement and I fear this appeasement still will last. Um, but of course uh, I would love to be, pro uh, to be proven wrong and as a parting, um, as a parting uh, bon mot, I'll just say that re recently, until recently anti-Semites anti were not afraid of admitting their anti-Semitism, but more recently I was told that uh, they are not anti-Semites, they are simply Judeo-skeptical. <laughs> Interesting uh, semantics. Um, yeah, so I, I think that we're seeing in the Ukraine case a kind of divergence, which is reflective of the situation of Ukraine's look to the West and want to be towards the West and tolerance education and EU admission means that you have to demonstrate that you've looked at your past um, in the Second World War and that you're, um, uh, you know, that you come to terms with your collaboration history. And so this has been going on in Ukraine for a long time. And I know people here in the audience, um, Jeff Feidlinger, who's, who's fabulous book is out there on the on the display uh, in the midst of civilization doing this work going there having these open exchanges with ukraine's bringing them here all the things that are markers of a free um, critical independent society you know that and instilling that and um and supporting that right and this is what is putin's um aim right now is to undo that right um and so in Ukraine right now, we have a new film coming out. I thought this was fascinating. Again, my my uh, kind of researchers on the ground called Dove uh, uh, Dove Bush. It's coming out. It just came out 2023, um, and this is how, in the cultural realm and the popular cultural realm, there are constructive efforts to go back to the past um, and talk about more of the interactions between Jews and Ukrainians 
um, and, and educate, right? So this is a film about a famous Ukrainian outlaw who's a folk hero um, and his relationship with Rabbi Israel ben Elizir. Um, and, the, and they've got, it's on Ukrainian television. Um, for viewers of the film, the uh, Ukrainian producer, director uh, stated, it will be a great revelation to learn that there is a whole Jewish epic about um, the rabbi's friendship with Dove Bush, and when he's preaching, he has Dove Bush's smoking pipe in his hands. Like, just to kind of t reconstruct history, not so much as a, a kind of list of pogroms and continuous violence and the reification of figures, national figures like Melnitsky, and of course these were horrors, horrors both in 1648 and as well the pogroms after the First World War, but to try to understand the country of Ukraine as a place with, you know, as a multi-ethnic society. Um, and this is really the project that they're undertaking right now, and it um, does not have anti-Semitism as a kind of official platform in the way that we are seeing um, kind of developing in, in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Philip. Okay. Um, well, the cash value. Um, first of all, I don't think that anti-Semitism has a positive uh, societal project. It's essentially a negative uh, movement. Uh, but it has very significant, to me, anti-democratic potential. And I am very concerned about the health of liberal democracies now in Western Europe and probably further afield too. So that's the first thing I say. I don't think it has a societal project, but it has a profoundly strong negative dimension to it. And I don't think it's possible to think about this with also, without also thinking about the psychological attractions of this to people who think of themselves as radicals and want to change the world. And I think the Holocaust was always, the taboo about anti-Semitism was always an impediment because there was a kind of guilt about the Holocaust that was felt right across Western Europe. Adorno, when he went back to Germany after the Holocaust, did some research on how Germans felt about the Holocaust, about what had been done to the Jews, and he found this extremely alarming. I think actually it was an Israeli psychologist who suggested that Germans will never forgive the Jews for Auschwitz. <laughs> but as my daughter pointed out, that it isn't just the Germans. And actually, the Germans, I think, are the less of a problem now than many other parts of Western Europe. Um, but I also think there is an excitement about breaking the taboo, which should not be underestimated. Another great French Jewish philosopher, Vladimir Yankelevich, once said, oh, the Jews are the new Nazis. How delightful. So I think this is a worrying dimension. But what it's, to, to summarize the situation that we find ourselves in now, I would say this. We do not face in Western Europe a, sp a state-driven, a state-sponsored anti-Semitism anywhere. Not in Germany after the Nazi past, not in France, and not in Britain. The states, both individually and collectively in the form of the European Union are in some ways anchored in opposition to anti-Semitism. They feel compelled at least to make statements that anti-Semitism is not acceptable. And this is true particularly in Britain where the Conservative Party has made this very clear, but so too has the post-Corbyn Labour leader, Keir Starmer, made this clear. Anti-Semitism for leaders of the political parties, for leaders of the state, is unacceptable. But that does not mean that the institutions of liberal democracy are immune. Right? The media, the judiciary, these are more difficult areas. But I think the really big problem is not inside the state, it's in civil society. Not the whole of civil society, but in a section of civil society, particularly on the left, and particularly among radical Islamists. And this matters because in British universities especially, anti-Semitism is now being given free reign. 
You mentioned some of my affiliations before. I want briefly to mention something that I'm very closely involved in now, which is the attempt to set up a, a center, the London Center for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, because we are so worried about how antisemitism has become a common sense among so many in British universities, both faculty and students. This was mentioned in the United States, and ideas move back and forth. The post-colonial idea comes back into the United States because post-colonialism is very attractive in Western Europe because of Britain and France's imperial past and Belgium and so on and so forth. But so too does the idea that Jews are white and part of the global power structure. They are part of the West, whether they are the tool of Western imperial interests in the Middle East or the other way around is not entirely clear. Why does this matter so much? It matters because in universities where you have mass participation, that is where young people are getting their ideas formed. That is the next generation of political activists, the next generation of politicians, the next generation of journalists, including in social media, which, by the way, my daughter will not allow me to take part in. She'll get, you'll just get too upset, right? <laughs> but I know what goes on in there, right? Okay? And the next generation of opinion formers and the next generation of policy formers. Now, it's not a majority view of civil society. All the opinion polls suggest in Britain and in Western Europe that the large majority of people do not think that anti-Semitic anti-Zionism is right. But a significant section of people who are politically motivated, politically engaged, and believe themselves to be righteous, who think they are on the, the side of social justice, who think they are anti-racists, that's where they're getting their ideas. That's why I'm involved in that center. That's why I'm very grateful that you asked me to come here today, because this is a terrain we have to fight on now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, we have some questions from from the audience, and the first one, uh, uh, Philip, I, uh, folds into your last comments, which is, uh, my British Jewish friends claim the accusations of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party are greatly exaggerated and cynically uh, weaponized by the right. Can you comment? Yeah, okay. I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the tradition in Britain of keeping quiet, okay? For the first time in my life, a large demonstration was organized by British Jews outside Parliament, which I went to. That's unprecedented in the history of British Jews, to come out on the streets on your own. You can come out if you're covered by everybody else and nobody notices you're there. That's one thing, right? But to come out... So the overwhelming majority of Jews in Britain understood quite clearly what anti-Semitic anti-Zionism was and what Corbyn believed. A tiny, utterly unrepresentative group, and this may be who your friend was referring to, have launched this charge. But this is an anti-Semitic argument. It says that the reason we lost is because of the Jews, because there was a conspiracy by the Jews. And this goes back to the universalism I talked about before, right? If you have a form of universalism, right, that excludes Jews, that finds Jewish power to be the explanation for why things go wrong, that's what you end up with. But it is inherently and fundamentally anti-Semitic. Um, thank you. Uh, Jan, for you, um, a question. What do you think should be done with uh, the subject of de-Judaization of the Holocaust in Poland? Um, well, I don't think much can be done in Poland. I would like us to start here. 
Um, and one of the aspects of digitization, which is flagrant in Poland, but also shines brightly in the West uh, as Polish exportation is something I called righteous defense. This is basically presenting the righteous Poles, which were very brave people, which deserve, who deserve our a full support, their memory, and so on, pre representing, presenting these people as a national average, so to say, as a default position of the Polish nation, or as a default position of the Lithuanian nation. You can just, uh, just replace here the names. So <clears throat> the thing is, this is one of the most uh, dramatic examples of um, the Judaization of the Holocaust, because you don't speak about the Jews, you shift the focus on few noble Gentiles, and then you present them as European average, which of course is, uh, has nothing to do with historical truth. And this is being done as an export, let's say, a software exported from Poland to the West by the means, for instance, of the Pilecki Institute, which opened its office in New York. So you can do something right here, uh, trying perhaps to tell the good people at Pilecki Institute not to uh, poison the well from which we are drinking. Um, and what happens uh, in Poland, what can be done? I would have said more Holocaust education had I not known any better. I just learned from my colleague who is polling high school students in Poland that there is a strict correlation between the levels of growing anti-Semitism and the number, growing number of classes in Holocaust education being taught. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't have a clear answer. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can say only as a historian is that uh, what I can do in my own uh, field is to write and leave the books in hope that someone will pick them up someday. Thank you. One last question and quickly because we are out of time, Wendy. Um, there are numerous scholars such as Professor Krubowski uh, in Poland and uh, even in Lithuania. Are there s Ukrainian scholars? Uh, not Ukrainian Jewish, but Ukrainian scholars who are working in the subject of the Holocaust. And uh, what is the extent of memorialization of the Holocaust in Ukraine today? Uh, yes, there are um, new generations of scholars working on the Holocaust in Ukraine. Some of them I've worked with, um, and some of them are here. They've they've fled. Uh, they're you know been displaced. Um, they're in Berlin. They're scattered. That community has just been completely disrupted. I had a doctoral student who died in Dnipro. Uh, we are losing an entire generation of of educated. Uh, young Ukrainians um, at different levels, actually, um, not just doctoral students, but this is this kind of uh, educational work that I've been talking about that we've all invested in um, that, you know, is, is so valuable and it shows us that it actually does work. Um, I don't know what kind of uh, Holocaust teaching is happening in Poland to increase anti-Semitism. All courses are very different. We don't know. We haven't been in the classroom. <laughs> so, I, you know. Okay, um, but yeah, I, um, we have, uh, you know, um, Andre Portnov, we have um, Yaroslav Hirtsak, we have Antonoli, uh, Anatoly Podolsky, who runs the program in Kiev. Um, there was a program in Dnepro, Takuma, uh, Shupak, uh, we have uh, Kruglov, who's been displaced to, I mean, there's just a, a, a entire community, and I have to actually acknowledge the Holocaust Museum for putting uh, resources behind that very deliberately. They do have some in-house, very good in-house expertise, Vadim Altska, Natalia Lazar. Mm. Um, so this exchange does work, it's got to happen. Um, last little footnote is when I was working in Ukraine, um, I, I started to realize um, on this issue of Russian anti-Semitism, which is really uh, alive and well, um, that scholars would come to me in the same way that some have come to me from that institute at regular big events and start to question my interest in the Holocaust and tell me that I'm a tool of the Jews and why are you doing that, right? And this has happened to me in Germany as well. Um, I've been um, saluted, given the Nazi salute. I, yeah, it's, so I, um, I observe this in all its different forms and I, I observe it escalating and I also observe it um, uh, decreasing. It's possible. Thank you so much. Thank you for this really deep and, and, and thoughtful time, all of you. And thank you.